Happy Easter. Welcome to Trinity Place in Geneva, New York. My name is Cameron Miller, and this is a reflection for Easter Day. <clears throat> and I'm going to read to you uh, the liturgical reading that we had today, in case you're not watching this sermon as part of the worship video, um, because it's just so stunning. This is a letter to the New York Symphony Orchestra written by Helen Keller in March 1924. Dear friends, she wrote, I have the joy of being able to tell you that though deaf and blind, I spent a glorious hour last night listening over the radio to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. I do not mean to say that I heard the music in the sense that other people heard it, and I do not know whether I can make you understand how it was possible for me to derive pleasure from the symphony. It was a great surprise to myself. I had been reading in my magazine for the blind of the happiness that the radio was bringing to sightless people everywhere. I was delighted to know that the blind had gained a new source of enjoyment, but I did not dream that I could have any part in their joy. Last night, when the family was listening to your wonderful rendering of the immortal symphony, someone suggested that I, I put my hand on the receiver and see if I could get any vibrations. He unscrewed the cap and, and I lightly touched the sensitive diaphragm. What was my amazement to discover that I, I could feel not only the vibration but also the impassioned rhythm, the throb and the urge of the music, the intertwined and intermingling vibrations from different instruments enchanted me. I could actually distinguish the cornets, the royal of the drums, deep toned violas and violins singing in exquisite unison. How the lovely speech of the violins flowed and plowed over the deepest tones of other instruments. When the human voices leaped up, thrilling from the surge of harmony, I could recognize them instantly as voices more ecstatic, upcurving, swift, and flame like, until my heart almost stood still. The women's voices seemed an embodiment of all the angelic voices rushing in a harmonious flood of beautiful and inspiring sound. The great chorus throbbed against my fingers with poignant pause and flow. Then all the instruments and voices together burst forth an ocean of heavenly vibration and died away like winds when the atom is spent, ending in a delicate shower of notes. As I listened, with darkness and melody, shadow and sound filling all the room, I could not help remembering that the great composer who poured forth such a flood of sweetness into the world was deaf like myself. I marveled at the power of his quenchless spirit by which out of his pain he wrought such joy for others. And there I sat, feeling with my hand the magnificent symphony which broke like a sea upon the silent shores of his soul and mine. <laughs> and there I sat, feeling with my hand the magnificent symphony which broke like a sea upon silent shores of his soul and mine. <laughs> if you're like me, you got chills with that sentence describing Helen Keller's sense that she was touching Beethoven's finger across time like God and Adam on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Can't you just kind of close your eyes and imagine it? The music and invisible arc from Beethoven to Keller, 
the unspeakable beauty of notes rendered so fortunately that tongues and lips and breath can travel through time and distance and connect two deaf people. Well, what about Jesus and us? <laughs> I know there's no radio or vibration involved, no notes or symphony to connect the first century with the 21st century. It's only a story told so many times. It's like the newspaper in the recycling bin waiting to be taken out. But if Beethoven and Keller can connect like that, and you and I can see it with our imaginations, then it must be possible for the sublime wisdom and painfully tender sacrifice to reach like a long finger of love to touch us, you and me, even here in a storefront worship space in Geneva, New York, or wherever you are. You and me, all of us. I don't know what resurrection is, I really don't. I'm not even sure the legions of Christians and piles of Christian doctrines know what resurrection is. But we do, we do know that from out of the darkness of that grave and from underneath the pall of grief, grief and the rattling of fear, some light of love named Jesus pierced the emptiness and jolted those who walked near the tomb. We also know that light has touched, enraptured, surged, and arced through the deafness of history and the blindness of geographical distance and the closed door of science to touch people in an ocean of different ways ever since Jesus died. Now, most of us here in this place are not Pentecostal or born again or raised to imagine that we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as if Jiminy Cricket sitting on our shoulder. Those aren't core bits of this tradition here. Do you know what we are? You know what we are? We are a people of words. Yeah. We're word people. Words in a prayer book, words in a Bible, words in poems, words in song, words from mystics, words from teachers and prophets, words, words that blow the mind and touch the heart, words that rattle us and shake us, words that relieve and comfort us, words that have changed our lives, words that inspire belief, words that provoke doubt, words that open our minds to possibilities and turn us around, words that subvert us, words that heal us, words that wrap, inspire, and call, and lead us. Words do all of that to us, just as surely as vibrations brought the New York Symphony Orchestra to a blind, deaf woman. Words. Words sung upon notes and words seeping through the silences as we read them, and words spoken to our ears. We are a people of words, and I'm here to tell you that words, yes, just words, are every bit as spiritual as any mystical vision or any ecstatic Pentecostal ballyhoo. Words are as spiritual as any Zen koan or any Hindu, Hindu mantra. Words connect us to Jesus. Words connect us to that moment when light pierced darkness and transformed a brutal state-sponsored torture and execution into an experience of resurrection. And in that experience, somehow, in some way, Jesus lived. In the same way that Ludwig von Beethoven touched Helen Keller in real time through a radio she could not see or hear, Jesus can touch us 
through words he left behind. Words fly on the wings of time and sing on the tongues of men and women and are etched on the delicate leaves of paper, whether handwritten or spit out with technology. I'm not dismissing other forms or mediums of connection, but I am raising up the homely word as our communal medium. What I'm inviting us into here is an understanding. It's about our mind and how to open it and how to allow words to unleash their power. Words that tell stories and words that tell secrets. Words that offer morals and words that point to sublime truths. Words of parables and sayings and poems. Allow them to enter our minds the way that Helen Keller allowed vibrations to enter her body and her heart and her imagination. Allow Jesus to live even though he died. Allow Jesus to come alive like and ancient notes of, like ancient notes we sing and play and listen to. Think of all the other people and ideas and places we have allowed to come alive for us on the wings of words. Our hearts pound, for example, when we hear certain notes strung together on scores of music passed down through centuries. Our thoughts stutter when we hear certain phrases of oratory captured in writing or recording that never seem to fade or turn brown. Our memories, our memories bring back to life again and feelings again and images and colors and textures again of particular moments in our lives. The only thing stopping us from experiencing the full power of words is the difference in our attitudes toward them. But if we free words, free them, to become the vehicles upon which Jesus comes alive, we will suddenly understand that Easter is not an occasion that insists the Bible is fake news or literal truth. Easter is a moment in which we're invited Invited, to free, invited in free of charge and without coercion to let the power of words be the bridge that we have needed for a dead man to come alive like Ludwig did for Helen. Helen said she could hear through what she could feel. Well, we can feel through the words that we hear. Just listen to this. Listen to this for a second. Even, even close your eyes and, and feel it as I read it. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to the apostles an idle tale, and they did not believe them. <laughs> you feel that, right? You feel the burn in that, right? If, if you're a woman, and even some men, you know that experience, don't you? You know that experience of sharing the wisdom of your heart and have it considered to be an idle thought or feeling that is not worthy of embrace. You know that feeling. You have stood there yourself. Know that exact experience of standing between those women who have had a life-changing experience and a bunch of men who think that they're arbiters of truth and wisdom and who deny their experience. This is the arc of this story, the one that offers to transport us across time and distance and belief to allow the words to connect us with that Easter moment. Standing in between those women and men, standing there in a hot tension, a tense distance among human beings who know and care about one another, and yet roiling with rejection and belittlement and arrogance, fear, grief, anger, confusion, and hope. Can you feel that with your memory, that experience? Or this. 
I bet that you can feel a time that your own personal darkness was pierced by a light. A light that came out of nowhere with unexpected agency even. Now let the words of this story reconnect you with that experience. Feel, feel your moment in these words. We bring to these words the wrong ideas. <laughs> when we ask these words, when we ask this story if it's true or did it really happen or did it really happen in this way, <laughs> we're thinking ourselves into a dead end. Can you imagine if Helen Keller had put her hand on the radio diaphragm and thought, I bet this isn't real. <laughs> the vibrations would have delivered nothing. She would have not allowed herself the sensation of feeling Beethoven. We are a people of words. When we allow the power of words to touch us and to connect us to moments we haven't yet experienced. Easter Day, not just the words of Luke's story or Helen Keller's story, but Easter Day is all of the words of this day, the prayer words, the flower words, the words that we sing together, the words of Jesus' ongoing table fellowship words, the alleluia words, all of it. All those words are the, are the meaning of Easter Day. They have power if we allow them to connect us to something strange and wonderful, something, something far more than an idle tale. Happy Easter to you, and may you feel these words, and may you feel your life in these words. Amen. Peace be with you.